All right, everybody, welcome back to Production ML Papers to Know. Um, in this series, we talk through what I think are really exciting papers to know about if you're building machine learning powered products. Um, and this week, we are talking about a paper called Leveraging Unlabeled Data to Predict Out of Distribution Performance. And we actually have the author of that paper here to chat with us about it. Um, so thanks for being with us. Do you want to introduce yourself really quick? Yeah, hi. Thanks for thanks for inviting me. Hi. So I'm Saurabh Kirk. I'm a fourth year PhD student at the machine learning department at Carnegie Mellon University. I work with Zachary Lipton and Sivaram Balakrishnan. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to talk about this paper with you, Josh. This, this week, we're talking about a paper that's about how can we, if we've trained a model on some data offline, and then we are deploying it on model where the, the data that's flowing in in production might be out of distribution, how can we tell how the model might be performing on that out of distribution data? I'll screen share here and walk through the paper and we can talk through some different parts of it. So the first question I have for you is, how did you decide to work on this topic to begin with? Yeah, so I think to answer uh, that question, let me like maybe like give you two liner primer of okay, what I in general work on. So I, I work on like trying to address this problems of how do we adapt models when there is a distribution shift and how can we understand how models are responding to sort of distribution shifts that happen in wild and under some sort of structural assumptions like label shift and then sort of some positive and unlabeled learning. So one natural question before one asks answers about adaptation is to understand how is the distribution shift affecting my model's performance. And this was sort of one natural question that, okay, people have tried to look at in the past, but they've looked at it from a point of view of like distribution and distances and stuff like that. But in, 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 in these large scale models and in, in deep learning where, where data input distributions are so high, I don't think that that is the line, right lens to look at. Whereas one obvious lens is to actually see how my model is responding in terms of its performance when there is a distribution. So I think that was like the main motivation to actually sort of condition on the model and understand how with respect to the model, the distribution is sort of shifting and, and how it's affecting its like accuracy, which is one aggregate measure. I think this is a really important point. And so I think it's worth double clicking on because this is this is why I was excited to chat about this paper to begin with. So why is it not good enough to just measure distribution shift for a model? Yeah, so I think traditionally people have been looking at measuring distribution shifts in form of like some sort of two sample tests. One canonical ways to understand, okay, has my sort of distribution shifted. And more often than not, when the input space is for, say, for example, images, even sort of slightest of the shifts will generate some sort of outputs that would say that, yes, the distribution has shifted. But yeah. those kinds of outputs will more or less be not useful because then we'll make systems sort of very pessimistic that, okay, my distribution has shifted. I don't know what to do. Let me just flag to say no. Whereas I feel that like this aggregate measure of how my model is performing under the distribution shift is maybe a little more optimistic way to actually talk about okay how the how the model is responding and hence maybe take some some decisions that that the practitioner might care about to summarize i think what you're saying is if our goal is just to detect distribution shift well yeah. distributions are kind of shifting back and forth all the time right especially if they're high dimensional and so if you detect a shift in the distribution then that may or may not actually have an impact on the actual outcome that we care about right which is is our model exactly. performing well? Yeah. And so yeah. why not just measure, why not just try to measure that thing that we care about so that we don't get these like false signals of, hey, there was some shift here that may not actually be meaningful. Yeah, and then just to sort of add one point to it is some other measure of distances in, in maybe like say input space can be a bit too pessimistic if a practitioner is sort of computing like let's say some distance in like input space, like, like let's say some processing distance or something. Those distance measures can actually be very pessimistic. So I think that's good motivation. Let's try to see if we can predict how the model is actually going to perform on some other distribution. Can you give us a quick overview of how the method for doing that actually works? So the problem setting here is actually very simple. Let's say I have some source data distribution, which is like the training data on which my model is trained. And let's say I observe n labeled examples from, from that source distribution. We train a model on that distribution. And then we can maybe like do back and forth iteration with some sort of hold out data and like do some hyperparameter tuning and let's say we obtain some model f that we think performs sort of in some 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 measure of like accuracy based on now on that hold out data what we want to sort of do here is we want to estimate that model's performance on some target data or on, on some target distribution from which we only have access to unlabeled examples however there is an implicit assumption that these two data distributions share exactly the same set of classes. If my source model was trained to classify cat versus dogs, maybe the distribution of cats and dogs are changing in some sense, but I'm actually still classifying cats and dogs. And what I have is I have only access to unlabeled images 
of cats and dogs in Matawi. I want to predict accuracy of this strain model. The method here, which we call a sort of average thresholded confidence is works sort of as follows. So we had holdout labeled source data on which we were sort of do, maybe like you doing some sort of hyperparameter. So here we tune one more parameter, which we call as threshold. And then the threshold is obtained as follows. We choose a threshold such that the fraction of examples that get a score smaller than that threshold matches the error of that classifier on that holdout. Got it. So what you're saying is our goal is to learn this threshold T and we can think about this as like a threshold for the score produced by the classifier. And yeah. okay, let's say that our accuracy on our training set is 50%. Then let's choose the threshold T such that um, half of the data, like 50% of the data has a score below that threshold and 50% has above it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And if it were 90%, yeah. it'd be 90 and 10, and et cetera. Yes, yes. So basically, yeah, the max confidence, which is one scoring function, satisfies that property. And yeah, then, yeah, so sort of, I was assuming in my description that the score function is sort of max confidence, but yeah, we can then choose score functions like negative entropy and then stuff like that. And we show that sort of these different score functions, although they respond sort of slightly differently, all of these do really well in terms of like how well we, they are able to like estimate uh, target performance. Yeah. So, so what are, what are the limitations here in terms of which metrics you can, um, you can actually do this method for? Yeah. So I think one inherent assumption, I'm not sure if it's a limitation, but one inherent assumption that we made throughout this paper is we are actually only thinking about like problems that deal with like multi-class classification. So yeah. inherently, we assume that the metric of interest here is accuracy. So one limitation that I consider that we have for this work is it might not extend very obviously to regression settings. Yeah. So if you're doing regression or some other sort of problem setting, maybe this is not the technique to use. Did you find this actually works in practice? So here, basically, what we strikingly observe is that there are like some obvious heuristics that one can incorporate like from past literature and some that, that, that act as a baseline. What we observed across is like across these 12, 15 different dom different data sets where each data set sort of cover multiple pair of source and target. We observed that this method tends to work strictly better than like all other methods. X axis here is like rescaled estimation error, which is basically how well I'm doing with respect to, let's say if I fix the method, say uh, average confidence, which is like this method represented the basic, how well it is doing with respect to that. So that orange, crosses fall on a straight line at 1.0. And we are sort of talking about relative estimation error with respect to that. Yeah. And we observe that, yeah, they do consistently well. Here, basically what we are doing is we have a model trained on one source data set, one each on like, let's see, part 10, image net 200, living 17 weeks. And details of these data sets are there in the paper. So let's say we have one model that is trained. We can generate several synthetic or natural ships for each of these data sets. So each point here in some sense on our X axis is a different target distribution that we consider and we plot its accuracy with respect to the model that have trained on source on X axis. And note that we do not have access to this number. This is what we are trying to predict on Y axis. We try to plot the number that we get with our method ETC and with other contemporary or like previously proposed methods. Yeah. Ideally, what we would want in this plot is to have any method lie on the line y equal to x. That is, whenever the accuracy is sort of the true accuracy is x, we want to predict that as the predicted accuracy. Yeah. So the idea here is like each of these dots or x's is a different data set. So you're using like a ton of data sets. Um, yeah. Each and dot here is a different data set margin. Like there's sort of three copies of each data set because of three different methods. Method. But, but yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. And so what this shows is that uh, these data sets like a perfect method that perfectly predicted accuracy, each of these dots would be on the y equals x line. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so what, we, what we're what we seeing here is like a lot more of these dots are very, very close to the y equals x line for your method as opposed to the baselines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's all like, again, like, yeah, like, yeah, empirically we observe that this tends to do much better than, than, than yeah, like previously proposed. Uh, well, what, and so what are, can you just give like a sort of brief overview of what the heuristics you're comparing to are? There's actually one uh, heuristic, which is this generalized disagreement equality, which is basically what it tries to do is it tries to train two models instead of training one model. And it trains two models separately on maybe like the same training set that we have. So they take two models and they compute disagreement of these two models on hold, on, on sort of the target unlabeled. Got and it. what in their paper they observed is that for in-distribution data, that is when the holdout 
when the target distribution is sort of IID with respect to source, this GD does really well. Mm. And they had some preliminary Out of distribution. Results. It doesn't generalize as well, it sounds like. Yes, and they had some preliminary results showing that it can sort of, it, it has some promise on OD. And even in our paper, we observe that this is actually the method that does second best. I think like the, the sort of top line for the experiments is simpler method. You don't really have to do anything other than just pick this threshold. And works better across a range of different data sets and a range of types of shifts. For folks that are interested in diving deeper, it's interesting also to look at the specific types of shifts that they looked at in the paper and the specific data sets, because there's a lot of good thinking there as well. What I'd love to do now is for such a simple method, it's maybe like, it might be surprising to some people that it works so well. Can you help us like build some intuition for why this actually works? I would like, I would like to say one thing here, which is, uh, which is sort of maybe like going through like the impossibility results. Yeah. Uh, in, in like a one liner. In this paper, we show that basically, if you do not have any assumptions on the classifier, no single method of estimating accuracy will work under different natures of sort of distributions. That is, we will only always be able to construct two distributions of P of Y given X, such that for one, the method will be very good, and for the other, the method will fail catastrophically. One example could be like, let's say that your label distribution changes. If you don't have access to any labeled data, then you can't really predict that just from the inputs to the model. Is that sort of an example of, an intuitive example of this result or is that something different than what you're talking about here? So uh, partly true, partly partly true, but okay, I'm trying to say here, is if there's no structural assumption about how my distribution is shifting from source to target, then mm -hmm. all bets are. I see. But if there is some structure in form of, let's say, the label shift assumption, which is P of X given Y is not changing, then actually we can give provable method that we have actually discussed in our appendix. We will be able to actually predict accuracy just from the unlabeled. Got it. So what you're saying is if you don't have any assumptions about the classifier or the nature of the shift, then yes, no matter yes. what method for predicting accuracy you pick, there's always yeah. going to be some shift that exactly. breaks that method. But exactly. if you know something about the classifier and the shift, like if yes. you know that there's no label shift, then there are methods yeah. that can probably do a good job of doing this. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we have like more discussion about that in, in the paper, uh, in appendix. Do you have any intuition for why yes. empirically this technique does seem to work pretty well? Yeah, sure, sure. So, okay. So in the, yeah, so there is actually definitely like some intuition, even sort of why we tried this, this method, right? So in the past, there has been some work where people have shown that model confidence or like my models, like softmax, like, like the, the, the max confidence or entropy of my model prediction, like the softmax prediction is actually a good indicator to some extent of OD data. So in some sense, people have shown that if the max confidence stays high, then we can be reasonably confident that the model is in some sense in distribution versus if the max confidence sort of degrades to a very small value. And if you're predicting something that is close to let's say one over K, then there's some sort of OD points that you are, you are, you are observing. And this, this has been like an exploration that, that people have done empirically in the past. Yeah. And, th and this is very common in practice as well, right? Like you, um, you log the, the confidence of your model's predictions. And if you are starting to see a lot of low confidence predictions, then that might be an indication that something's going wrong. It's probably worth caveating that as well, though, that Models also do produce very confident wrong predictions out of distribution. So and those are real examples, right? Yeah. yeah. So exactly, exactly. So in some sense, yeah. Again, like this, so that's why I think one thing that I want to like make very clear here is we are also trying to highlight from this paper not just property about a model or a method, but also the nature of shifts. So in some sense, these not so most of the shifts that we consider here are not adversarially constructed. They are actually shifts that occur naturally in practice. So a highlight, a key highlight here is there are some assumptions that these natural distribution shifts satisfy that lead to these strikingly simpler properties in practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So okay. there's, there's, um, you know, you can always adversarially con construct a shift that is able to break these commonly used techniques, but in practice, most shifts look a certain way. And so if you are, if you take that into consideration, then that's why some of these sort of theoretically hard to justify, but empirically useful techniques actually work. Yeah. 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 And I think, I think sort of now answering the question about like intuition of this method. So the intuition here is exactly this. What we are basically trying to identify is what are the fraction of examples that my model predicts sort of confidently versus what are the examples or what are the fraction of examples where it's relatively lesser confident. 
And we are trying to like sort of partnerize it into a decision. And the decision boundary that sort of tends to work well is the same decision boundary that sort of uh, the decision boundary that tends to work well on target. We find that is the same decision boundary that works well on the source. So that's like the high level intuition. And in, in sort of like this, this toy model, we actually make this intuition uh, like provably possible in like in like a toy setting where there's some spurious correlation between how my classifier is related to like some of the attributes of my input data. And this method ATC is able to sort of marginalize out uh, that spurious correlation and actually just and actually identify a confidence, which in some sense uh, can tell you like the decision boundary of okay, if examples sort of lie above the threshold then they are actually incorrect examples. And if examples lie below the threshold, they are incorrect. Got it. Super interesting. You, you want to have some sense of what is the threshold of confidence above which models tend to predict things correctly. And then, yeah. Yeah. And then the way that you would detect if the model is going to be less accurate than normal is if it's predicting a lot more things with low confidence, which sort yes. of intuitively makes sense, right? Because that means those, those low confidence things they, I mean, it's, they might still be correct predictions, but they're just less likely to be correct. Exactly, exactly. And indeed, in practice, we do see that we do not always get the decision boundary correct. But in some sense, the number of examples that get predicted correctly but have low confidence sort of cancel out with the examples that are sort of relatively higher confidence but are incorrect. So in some sense, if that thing sort of balances out, this this threshold like like would work in, in practice. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Wrapping this up, I would love to hear where are you excited to see the field go in terms of thinking about approximating model performance or maybe more principled ways of do like achieving the same goal that most people have when they detect distribution shift? Yeah, so I think moving forward, there are several definitely like a lot of interesting directions to explore. And just like one thing that we were like just discussing a few minutes ago is what are like these underlying properties that distribution shift sort of satisfy that actually lead to these properties, lead to like these empirical phenomena, right? So I think, yeah, exploring that, like that's sort of an open question. And I think a lot of exploration is needed on that end. And the other thing is, okay, in this paper, we tried to like look at the classification problem, right? But I believe that some similar kinds of heuristics can also be like explored in regression. Yeah. And I think those are also like very, very useful in practice. So I imagine sort of, yeah, like taking some insights from these kinds of works where we identify like some simpler empirical phenomena underlying these, these large models and like big data sets can sort of then be like extended to maybe like some other regression setting, like setting like, yeah, some regression tasks. So. Yeah, I, I think it makes sense. I, you're, you're painting a vision of trying to better understand the structure of distribution shifts, how those relate to heuristics or other simple methods that are able to do well under those structured assumptions for a wide range of different machine learning problems. And then having almost like this toolkit that matches the machine learning problem that you're working on and the types of shifts that you expect to what is the simple method that might do well in practice to help you detect them. Yeah, yeah. I think it's yeah. really compelling. Yeah, and, and and I think one very direct future work is to which I think I'm trying to like investigate more into is to actually see that where are actually what are like the practical settings where this method breaks and why it does. Break. So I think that is also I think a very crucial question that one needs to answer before one can actually actively use these methods in practice, because yeah, like just relying them blindly will not really give us anything so trying to also like understand practical failure modes is equally i feel important i'm i'm really excited about this paper and also this just general direction because i think it's very very difficult for a lot of practitioners to tell hey i i got an alert in the middle of the night that said my you know my kl divergence is 0 0.37 like does that mean that i need to wake up and go into the office or does, does that mean my model is probably fine so yeah congrats on a great paper and thanks for spending the time to chat with us yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me.